We can't leave health just to clinicians. It's uh, much more important than that. And the health humanities really uh, kind of came about because um, back in 2006, uh, I felt that medical humanities was largely about teaching medics. Um, it didn't seem to include uh, other uh, professionals involved in, in health and social care. Uh, and also, um, I thought there was much more to arts and humanities at community level, um, non-clinician level. So the health and humanities became something of an activist uh, applied field, um, trying to increase the inclusivity and trying to democratize approaches to the way that the arts and humanities work in terms of health. So not just the therapeutic track, not just the expert to broken uh, approach, um, but really looking at how different parts of society engage with the arts and humanities and for their health and the health of those around them. So um, eventually I ended up um, kind of getting behind a shift towards what I call creative public health. This is where we try to bring the public back into public health and we try to recognize the potential for non-clinical resources, creative industry resources, um, and a broader involvement of the public in their own health through the arts and humanities without medical prescription. Now we've been through quite a, quite a number of uh, months now of uh, lockdown uh, in the pandemic, the last 15 months. About 4.2 billion people have experienced some kind of lockdown. Um, over this last period. Um, and what we've seen, apart from all the, the, the tragedy and uh, the difficulties, etc., has been an outbreak of creativity uh, in this time, which has reminded us, I think, just how important creativity is to our lives. And uh, if you will, if we imagine, um, imagine the arts and humanities uh, disappearing overnight, um, we would have had one hell of a time dealing uh, with the prolonged lockdown situations uh, that, that we, many people have endured. The, the image there is actually um, by uh, my, my eldest son's uh, partner, who's an artist in Canada, um, and she painted this picture uh, during the lockdown. And uh, uh, it was very interesting to me because Alongside my son, uh, she, um, she duplicated their figures as a kind of a way of creating a, a community feel in the rather solitary lockdown experience they had along the Ottawa River. Now, one of the projects I've been involved in in this last year um, has been, ironically, on the great... Um, uh, public health advocate Florence Nightingale um, and last year was the bicentenary year of her birth and um, when we looked at Nightingale uh, we looked in terms of how the home uh, contributed concepts and material realities of the home uh, contributed to her work in developing healthcare and also her experience uh, herself um, in terms of what home meant to her. It, we didn't anticipate this, but um, during this uh, uh, period of, of research, it became quite clear to us that uh, the home has become very important, not least because so many people have been confined for prolonged periods in their homes. But let's just come back to that later. Florence Nightingale was a creative uh, practitioner as much as a contributor to public health. She was a prolific writer, a creative administrator, and she was visionary in, in, in the most artful sense in her social reforms of health at home, public health and statistics, 
professional training in nursing, district nursing and health visiting, hospital design and gender politics. And of course, we know um, how powerful she was uh, in this um, period and how we owe so much to her in this yes, uh, era of the hard. pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, I can hear some talking. Is that okay? Can you still hear me? Sure, oh, sure, we can hear you. It's, I just it's, it's, some, it's uh, uh, important that, that everyone else uh, mutes. Ah, okay. <laughs> That's yeah, fine. Please go on, Paul. We're all in the strange world of Teams and Zoom, so uh, we'll, 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 we'll go with that. Um, so Nightingale was creative um, uh, as a woman in the 19th century, uh, when women were largely uh, uh, considered to be there as an ornament and to embroider, if you will, or to, uh, to add to the, the, the wonderful work of men. Um, but uh, Nightingale, Nightingale had a very different, different approach to um, how the woman should be and how creative uh, she can be, and she was having none of it. So she broke out of the prison of her expected home life. Her expected home life was to, to be sewing or reading and amusing male guests. And as we know, she, she made a lot of contributions to the health of nations. Uh, she wrote books on how to be healthy at home. She was really quite profound in uh, dealing with uh, infection before really microbiology, microbiology came to the fore. And uh, in the last year of the pandemic, um, her, her ideas of ventilation and hand washing have, have revisited us. So it's interesting how, how history um, and things which happened many years ago can still have a bearing on uh, contemporary practices. There's a book for you, um, Florence Nightingale at Home, if you want to read more about how home influenced Florence Nightingale's uh, view of healthcare and uh, how to keep ourselves in our best condition. Um, and you may find it really interesting in light of what happened uh, in the pandemic. So that's just a flavour of kind of a historical project and, uh, uh, and how that may touch on um, uh, health, health uh, as, a, as, a, as a field. Now, many years ago, um, when I was working in a hospital for, for people with mental health problems, um, I came across... Um, a, a patient who was playing his clarinet in the, uh, in the corridor of the hospital. And at the time, I, I felt quite depressed in myself and uh, working in the hospital, it wasn't a very nice one, to be honest. And um, I felt uplifted by this individual, by, by the music they were making. And I found out a little later that this person was one of our country's uh, um, the greatest uh, jazz musicians. Uh, so on that day, I began to wonder, um, you know, who is recovering whom? You know, we often think the experts fix all the broken people, the patients, but on this day, I felt that this particular patient was healing and, and, uh, and fixing me. Um, and that led on to a project on the whole business of how we can recover together rather than as separate groups. Um, and this, uh, this initiative was, was driven by the recognition that uh, informal carers alongside patients and also health and social care practitioners themselves also need recovering, also need to be supported and we developed a notion of mutual recovery um, where we examine the way different arts uh, practices from dancing to uh, playing music, to uh, playing drums, to storytelling and so on, how these can 
advance mutual recovery, um, not just within groups of patients or groups of practitioners or family carers, but also all together as a community. Um, and I think this study was particularly valuable in, in probing and piercing the rather individualized conceptions of recovery in healthcare today and foregrounded just how important it is in, in, if we're innovating in terms of arts and humanities, how this isn't just about therapies for patients, but this is about environmental level therapy for whole communities, whether in clinical settings or not. So that was called Creative Practices Mutual Recovery. Um, and uh, we explored uh, a, a number of modalities, if you will, uh, both in the UK and overseas, including US uh, and, the Ch and China. Okay. And you'll see that some of the, these modalities actually continued into other uh, research projects, um, which were keen to uh, interrogate and to question why we are not uh, more concerned about mutual recovery of health and well-being, particularly uh, in this case mental health, and finding new ways to break the, uh, the often clinical chain in terms of knowledge development. So we found that creative practices can promote mutual dis, uh, recovery among and between service users or patients, family carers and uh, professional carers and arts and health professionals and enhance their mental health uh, well-being and their engagement and connectedness. And you can see the multiple impacts of that project by going on cpmr.mentalhealth.org.uk. And you can come back to this when I share the PowerPoint with you. We knew that creative practice is well established uh, in mental health. I mean, Florence Nightingale herself knew how important creative practice was uh, to her, both in terms of music, in, uh, in terms of crafts, in terms of reading, and in terms of writing. Uh, so if it was good enough for Florence, uh, we should be thinking about it very much today in terms of a shadow health service, as I indicated at the start. So creative practice breaks down social barriers, promotes trust, understanding of experiences and emotions, and helps to rebuild identities and communities and arguably compassionate spaces. So from that, that program, I went on to be part of what's called March Network, which is, um, I think, 1.25 million pounds uh, project, looking at um, the social and cultural assets for mental health in the United Kingdom and scoping through all the different ways that heritage, culture, arts, museums, galleries, the volunteering, green spaces, community centers, libraries, how all of these resources um, can uh, in, uh, be known, can be accessed, how we can get better sharing of information about those assets uh, to the public. So that's what we've been working on recently. If you're interested in this area, if you drop me in an email, I'll leave my email at the end, then uh, I can follow through on the, this particular project. Okay, so an, another a smaller uh, project, but uh, salient project was where we looked at the arts and humanities in relation to dementia uh, through dance, visual arts, theater and music. But what was particularly interesting for me with this one was um, the, the fact that we didn't separate out practitioners, family carers or people living with dementia, but we experienced these arts modalities together uh, on an equal basis. Um, we didn't have that kind of hierarchy or that therapizing uh, kind of approach 
it was more commuta communitarian um, and uh, community driven. And during the visual arts uh, project, uh, I, I did some art as well. So, uh, you know, I engaged in uh, the sessions and these were my, uh, my little creations, which I made by um, having double-sided uh, paper. So a different color on each side. And then I began to tear the paper into the middle and then I pulled out the middle bit and, and stuck that to one side. And I'm sure you agree they're fantastic pieces of art. Um, uh, but actually, I don't know why I ended up doing these like this, but I did. And I enjoyed making these. But it was only when I, I got uh, back home and uh, I realized that um, this, this black and white image that I'd made and the, the, the whole shape of it, um, I, I, I felt that what I'd been doing was expressing my grief um, because uh, in the year uh, prior to this, um, this, this session, I'd actually lost most of my immediate family. Um, so I was reduced uh, from a family of six to a family of two. Um, and I realized that this piece of art was an expression of grief and the, the little, the little um, fragment there was me, I think, uh, escaping the emptiness and the, the vortex of, of what had happened to me, the trauma. And I was so grateful. I was so grateful to the, the people living with dementia and their families and, and colleagues um, in this shared uh, creative event. Because unexpected, unexpectedly, um, I had actually been subject to mutual recovery, um, uh, which I hadn't anticipated. I hadn't um, considered that the, the difficulty, the loss of people living with dementia, both as, as individuals and the family members, uh, really, um, really enabled me, I think, to, to, um, to trust and to uh, empathize with loss and to be able to, for the first time, express this myself. So I'm, I'm grateful for that uh, experience of mutual recovery. It also um, prompted uh, me to look with my teams at new possibilities for how um, the arts and creativity can really impact on public health. And uh, I came across a wonderful um, short film, uh, Share the Orange, with Brian Cranston from Breaking Bad uh, to really, really conceptualize the whole business of um, what is lost, what is lost to us in, um, in, in dementia. And this film relates to how uh, the, the loss of brain material uh, being equivalent to an orange. And it was very impactful. And there was a little bit of animation in, in, the, in the piece, which, um, was by the uh, very uh, um, very well known uh, company Ardman, who make Wallace and Gromit and Shaun the Sheep, etc., and have won multiple Academy Awards and BAFTAs and so on. So I was very impressed with this whole business of um, how creative industry, such as animation, might actually show a way forward. And that's where uh, I got on to working with Ardman directly with a large commissioned uh, grant from the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Uh, originally it was called What's Up With Alex, but uh, the name changed to What's Up With Everyone. And in this uh, project, we developed with young people, for young people, um, five short animations, which um, were to uh, look at life's challenges. And uh, the young people identified five key challenges for them around 
the whole business of perfectionism, loneliness, competitiveness, uh, social media, and independence. And uh, this was launched, um, this campaign was launched in February and has already reached over 5 million. And if you go to um, What's Up With Everyone, uh, you will see, um, if I just click on that, uh, you will see uh, this landing page. Uh, it's a little bit about us here. And if you click on each of these themes, you will see um, a short animation and then support information and conversation about the topic area. And we have a seeking help up in the top right hand corner with uh, major links to major mental health providers in the UK to assist if, if, you, if you are uh, struggling particularly with this issue. But the main drive of this um, Health Humanities Initiative was to utilize the creative industries to advance mental health literacy amongst young people. But instead of the expert to broken line, you know, getting away from the professional to the young person and, and adulting and telling them what to do. It was the young people who came up with the themes and the challenges. And they also, uh, rather than actors uh, speaking for these characters, it's the young people in our project. So let me just play uh, one. Hopefully you can get the sound. Instead of revising, I will never shower again. This is where I live now, in the bin of shame, along with all this other rubbish. Oh God, that smell. I can't even get wallowing in a bin right. Anna speaking it's just that we cannot see the pictures but we can hear the, we can hear the sound okay so um I, can you see my slides now yes yes we yep. can i, I can I see apologize, the slides apologies for everyone but please do go on what's up with everyone.com and you you'll see the pictures behind the sounds uh, but these are the five characters that, that you can see on the powerpoint now um and they I mean, they're incredibly popular. They've gone on to the Artman YouTube channel as well, where you'll see Sean the Sheep and you know Wallace and Gromit and so on. So very high profile. We've had um, multiple celebrities getting behind it, as well as government ministers and MPs, and all the all the major organisations to do with either mental health, universities, or schools. Um, the, the target population was actually 17 to 24, but uh, with, with relevance um, right down to uh, age 11 onwards, um, basically secondary school level. Um, the, the main drive of this was to help young people in, in the transition to college, university, uh, and to, the, to life, you know, to the workplace, etc. So the initial research phase of this, which is being uh, written up now for peer review, shows that um, when young people view these films, um, they, their knowledge and attitudes towards uh, mental health uh, improved and they have a greater willingness to seek help and also confidence to help others. So, these are making a, a real difference already. Um, and um, I think the, the leading topic uh, for site visits uh, has been loneliness, which is perhaps not surprising given the pandemic. 
Okay, so those are, uh, I guess, a snapshot of a few uh, salient projects that I'm involved in with my teams, uh, which I, I can speak to and give you a sense of the, the, the variety and the different um, trajectories one, one can take uh, in, in, uh, in the arts and humanities for, for healthcare, health and well-being. Um, Health Humanities was a kind of manifesto that came out in uh, 2015, um, which you may have seen. And the Routledge Companion to Health Humanities, which came out last year, has, um, I think, about 65 chapters with about 80-something scholars from around the world, uh, giving a, a, quite a, a diverse flavour to... Um, the, the, the possibilities for the arts and humanities. There's even a chapter, for example, on the, the whole business of cooking, uh, cookery, uh, which um, you rarely see in, uh, in um, uh, typical books around the, the value of the arts and humanities for, for health. And we've also got um, chapters which take a more indigenous perspective uh, on, on arts and humanities and a more global perspective. And currently with Paul Cadets, um, I am the editor-in-chief for the Encyclopedia for Health Humanities with Springer New York, which comes out next year. So anybody interested in that uh, particular side of things or is interested in making entries to the encyclopedia, do drop me an email. Uh, another um, uh, book venture, which I think is pertinent for today, is the Arts for Health series, which um, I developed with Emerald. And these are the three, first three titles which have come out, Singing, Film and Reading. And these titles are written for the public. Um, they show the evidence base for the value of, of uh, these uh, uh, arts and humanities for uh, physical and mental health, and they provide entry points for the public on how these can uh, advance their, their uh, health and well-being, uh, and also uh, hints and uh, links to, to resources uh, uh, as well. So I think there will be about 18 in that series uh, overall. We'll have to see, maybe a bit, a few more than that. So do have a look out for those. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Florence Nightingale came out last year and uh, uh, you may well be interested in that and what it has to say about the place of home, the place of home in, in uh, health and well-being. And with my uh, son, Jamie, uh, we, we had lockdown apart but we decided to uh, take on board the mutual recovery uh, drive, I guess, and decided to write a book uh, on the social uh, and cultural history of cabin fever. Um, and when, when we did this, we, we were shocked to find that cabin fever was not, um, uh, was not written about a great deal, but we looked at the, the research on uh, prisons, on hostage taking, on uh, space, uh, space travel uh, research um, and so on in terms of the impact of prolonged confinement on, on mental health and suggested uh, antidotes to, uh, to cabin fever, to, to the, the mental health challenge of being indoors for so long. And one of the antidotes, importantly, which we proposed in the book was um, uh, cre creativity and create the creative arts uh, to, to buffer against the, the, um, the negative impacts of long periods, either alone or isolated with others. Um, so that, that came out uh, in March. So uh, do have a look at that if you're interested. And uh, yeah, that's uh, a picture of me there. Thank you, everybody. And the, that's a picture of me with the iconic character Morph uh, that really uh, kick-started um, Aardman Animations in, in Bristol in the UK. 
And uh, I think that was my first day uh, working with the company to really uh, give, give um, signal that creative public health uh, is important, how creative in industries such as Artman can be part of the health of the nation and become part of what I call a shadow health service. Thank you so much.